Hello, Rebels of the Sharp Illusion. Normally, I start off this podcast by saying hi, but I'm going to start this one off by saying hydration. We know how important hydration is for our bodies. It's the thing that keeps us running, right? You want to be a well-oiled machine. You want to be running efficiently. You know what can help you run efficiently? Liquid IV. It is the category-winning hydration brand fueling your well-being and their hydration multiplier is the one product that you are missing in your daily routine it comes in a little stick that's a powder and in just one stick you get five essential vitamins and two times faster hydration than water alone if you use it first thing in the morning maybe before a workout when you feel run down maybe after a long night out and doing a little party you know what i mean and what if you have like a long flight or something like that and you just right we all feel that way so add this to your water and that convenient packaging can go with you anywhere you go, even if you're going to the gym or you're traveling or you're at work and maybe you didn't have a great breakfast. At least it's something that will fuel you up in the morning. And there's a whole bunch of flavors that are available like sea berry, strawberry lemonade, concord grape, lemon lime, pina colada, tropical punch, watermelon, strawberry, passion fruit, guava, acai berry. Did I say that right? I never know how to say that. But Those are just some of the flavors. Here's some statistics for you folks. One stick of liquid IV in 16 ounces of water contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and even vitamin C. And we all know how important those B vitamins are. It's got three times the electrolytes of traditional sports drinks. It's made with premium ingredients. It's non-GMO and it is free from gluten, dairy, and soy. I'm going to offer you a great deal, Rebels. If you go to liquidiv.com and use offer code Sherpa, you can get 20% off of anything that you order on that site when you're shopping for some better hydration. So that's Liquid IV. Check it out at liquidiv.com. Podcast that you're listening to is being presented to you in cooperation with the SJ Network. If you're a person who'd like to appear on a podcast, contact Stephen Joyner at s-j-network.com. Dot com. Let's get on with the show. On this episode of Too Many Podcasts, we're joined by Brandon Shexnayer of the Southern Gothic Podcast. It's a podcast about scary stories in the southern U.S. Do you have any stories about scary places? Oh, yes. All you need to do is walk into the Sherpa's personal laundry room in the Sherpa Chalet. Talk about having nightmares for weeks. Welcome to Too Many Podcasts, the podcast about podcasts. Now, podcasting from the Sherpa Chalet on Mount Podcastia, he's your host, Jim, the podcast Sherpa. Hello there, Rebels of the Sherpa Lucian. Welcome to Too Many Podcasts. It is the podcast about podcasts and so much more. Jim, the podcast Sherpa, coming to you from Sherpa Lu Studios, high atop Mount Podcastia. And it's another week of me doing my deep dive through those mountains of podcasts that seem to flood our airwaves. Where do you go? What do you listen to? Who do you listen to? Follow me, I say. Follow me, the Sherpa. <laughs> I feel better now. And maybe we should start by talking about our guest today. Who's our guest today, Sherpa? His name is Brandon Chexnayer. He is the host and creator of the podcast called Southern Gothic. It's Southern history mixed in with some spooky stories, making it creepy, spooky. Ooh. But it's fun stuff. And I got to get to know Brandon In our little conversation, really enjoyable guy. He originally was an audio engineer, but he wanted to step out and do his own thing. And what did he do? He does what he loves. Spooky! So let's have a listen to my conversation with Mr. Brendan Shexnayer of the Southern Gothic Podcast. Hello there, Rebels. We are here in the spooky room of the Sherpa Chalet. My guest is the host of a podcast called Southern Gothic, and it mixes Southern history and spooky stories. And he's the host right here. It's a usually popular one. And we, we've got to get to know this guy and maybe get a scary story out of him. His name is Brandon Sheck Snyder, coming to us from Tennessee, originally from Louisiana. Brandon, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Jim. I, I really appreciate the invite. I'm glad to have you here. Now, because you're talking about all these different locations in the South, I'm curious, like when you grew up in uh, 
Louisiana, were there little scary spots that you knew of, like when you were a kid that you used to check out? Oh, yeah. I mean, I was New Orleans born and raised. So, uh, you know, I definitely grew up going to places. And and just to top it off, I had some I had parents who were really into genealogy. Okay. And this was before the Internet. I, you know, I was an 80s child. Right. So so what that meant was we went to cemeteries on weekends all the time because they were doing <laughs> research, you know. <laughs> So I uh, spent a lot of time in cemeteries as a kid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is an interesting way to s- lay a sentence down. I oh, spent a yeah. lot of time in cemeteries as a kid. Yeah, there's a reason I do this. Um, and I think it all started <laughs> off with that bit of childhood. You know, I mean, being in New Orleans, you know, it's you, you can't throw a stone without hitting a haunted place, right? Right. Just, the stories are everywhere down there. And, and just kind of being in that vibe growing up down there, you know, at the same time, even, you know, my my early, early teen years or, you know, preteen years is when like, you know, that interview at the vampire movie came out to really just add that extra, you know, sprinkle that cherry on top of the New Orleans lore at that point in time. So, so yeah, I mean, I grew up with a lot of stories, grew up kind of in this environment, um, you know, you could not down there. Right. And, right. Uh, and, and with, you know, with my parents interest and, in, and, in, and in doing research in cemeteries, you know, really is why I kind of end up, ended up doing this podcast the way I do, you know, and, and, and I say that, you know, really the basis of my show is kind of from that. It's kind of, I say, what I like to do is I like to find stories from all over the South that, that you might've heard from your mama or something, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like, like one of your grandparents told you this, this scary story from whatever little town you grew up in. Well, I'm going to take those stories and we're going to go, we're going to research them and we're going to get into the history of it. And we're going to kind of dig a little bit deeper into that story, find out what it really was. And, and that came from my own kind of background and, and my own childhood. So, yeah. In in some of your research, did you ever come across stuff that really kind of blew your mind? Uh, you know, in all honesty, it's it's every one is a little different. I, I think the ones though that really the major lessons that I've learned from it is um how there's certain themes that seem to to pop up in 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 all over the South. There's certain themes that seem to pop up in certain decades and and kind of as different as each place might be. And as different as as the stories might be, there are all these same archetypes that kind of, you know, run across the the, the boundaries of all of them. And, th- and that's been fascinating, kind of finding those, you know, we we all seem to be afraid of the same things at the same points in time. You know, if you understand what I'm saying there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's funny. A while back, I spoke to a woman who lives in New Zealand who has a, a, a show about ghosts and spirits and yeah. everything like that. And she mentions like there are certain creatures, I guess they call them cryptids, uh-huh. uh, that are very common throughout New Zealand that you don't really hear about over here. And I'm I'm wondering, right. are there certain, what we say, uh, I'm, we'll just say uh, ghosts or monsters mm-hmm. that are kind of recurring down in the South? Well, you know, we certainly have a lot of similar stories across the line, you know, that that come up. So uh, for some reason, Southerners really enjoy telling stories about dead brides. OK, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, it's kind of like something early 20th century, late 19th century. There's just it just seems like every small town has has some poor woman who passed away either on the eve of her wedding night or she was waiting for a man to come to the wedding and and he died or she died or something. And now this poor woman is spending eternity mourning her beloved. Right. And, <laughs> and this seems to be a very common theme and, and it kind of ties into a common ghost lore of, if you've ever heard of the lady in white, mm-hmm. um, kind of this classic tale that goes all the way back. I mean, European folklore has it all of this of, of that kind of ghost that, that might be, you know, a, a woman who's walking down the road and a car picks her up and, you know, and they're going to take her somewhere. And as soon as they arrive, they look in the back and she's gone. And, you know, that kind of classic story. Well, yeah. the South has this kind of thing of for some reason, it, it's always this tragedy on on a, a wedding. And, um, you know, so I see that a lot. But, uh, you know, in terms of like the cryptids in the background, you know, it, it's one of the things that's so fascinating about the South. And being able to stick to one region is the South here has a history that's relatively small compared to a place like New Zealand or sure. compared to a place like the UK or European history uh, when it comes to at least colonization, right? Obviously, there's a long history of indigenous people here. But, uh, you know, in this short period of time, about 400 years, what we had 
is we had all these different cultures, these different European cultures. The French were colonized in Louisiana, the Spanish in Florida and Texas, the British on the on the you know on the shoreline, the Scott Irish were in Appalachia, and then of course you mix that together with the indigenous people who were here, and then of course the African slave trade, and all at once we have this convergence of people that have this old folklore traditions all smashed together in a small place. And so to your point of, you know, the New Zealand folks having their own kind of cryptids, um, the South kind of brought things like that from other places and brought them in. So we kind of have some unique folklore that stems from, you know, uh, places like France, European folklore that just kind of evolved in the swamps, if you will, (laughs) you know. So, yeah. so so when the ancestors came, they brought the ghosts with them, was what you're saying. Uh, yeah, you could say that, you know. I mean, you you know, we have we have down when I was growing up, we uh, you know, we're we're in New Orleans, so you're right there in that kind of swamp country, and we always heard of this one creature that was called the Rougarou. Okay. And the Rougarou was kind of this swamp werewolf, you know, that you would scare kids with. Uh, you you would hear about this werewolf that uh, it would come out. It would buy. It's just a traditional werewolf, really. Except it's kind of it kind of had this like Catholic bend to it. Okay, um, and and this werewolf, it 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 had it, it really the reason that we had this werewolf and this creature is if you think about the Cajun people when they came to Louisiana, right? You know, they came and they're from France. And France had this long history of being afraid of werewolves. They had this one in particular, uh, you know, this 18th century creature called Labette that was a, a monster out there, a werewolf out there. And, and that was really big in their culture. Well, when these French people came over to Louisiana, they had all these fears that they had from back home. And now you plop them down in the middle of a swamp that they don't recognize you know, and they don't really understand what what the swamp and all the critters are down here. And they've got their old fear in a new place and kind of a new creature kind of seems to get born out of this and how they explain some of their fears down in the swamp. And so, you know, so I grew up being afraid of the Rougarou because, you know, 300 years ago, my ancestors thought, you know, there was this this crazy swamp critter out there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have any like personal experiences with spirits or? Anything you know, like that? I, I haven't had any personal experiences and it. it. It's always kind of bothered me because, you know, I spent years telling ghost stories at this point, made a career out of telling ghost stories and spent so much time traveling to places, going to haunted locations and all, trying to have them even, you know, um, and uh, <laughs> I'm here, come get know, me. <laughs> it's like, I, like, come on, y'all. I'm doing really good PR for you. Right. I mean. Don't I deserve at least one shadow person show up, right? <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, I've tried. I mean, I, I go to a lot of places. I'm not a ghost hunter. Um, I'm not one of those people that likes to go and use equipment and and do all the recording and devices and mm-hmm. stuff. Uh, you know, I, I think more. I, I'm more partake in what you'd call like haunted tourism. Okay. Um, you know, like I've done some some uh, overnight stay or not overnight stays, but I did an overnight at a uh, Waverly Hills sanatorium just in the last year. Uh, spent a lot of time going to cemeteries all over still to this day. I'm still a, still a cemetery nerd. Um, but you know, I've gone to a lot of the places as many as I can of ones that we cover. I, I'll, I'll try and go out and visit and get the vibe. And I really enjoy that. Um, I um I really enjoy the the ghost tourism as an industry, the ghost tours and local tours. And mm-hmm. um, you know, and I do some of that as well. I have a friend who owns a company and um I help her out during busy season and from time to time just because I enjoy, you know, that a lot. But um unfortunately, in spite of all of that time I spend at these places where I'm supposed to get creeped out and spooked out, still to this day, no, nobody's shown up yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We have to put the emphasis on the word yet, right? <laughs> right, exactly. You know, now, I mean, look, I, I, I've had, I had recently, I went on a, a show where we, uh, a medium, I was with a medium and uh, it was her show and we were discussing just some of the things that I've been been to and some of the places and some of the things I, I experienced in terms of the natural and, and some of these things. And, and she's like, oh, no, 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 this is, it's brewing, it's going to happen and it's, everything's going to change. So 
maybe she knows something I don't. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we can circle back in six months and I'll have something scary to tell you that I, <laughs> <laughs> like you said, you're, you're there for the promotion of all these spirits. One of them is probably looking for payback at some point. Payback. Oh, I never thought of it that way. You see, I thought <laughs> I was trying to do them justice by telling their stories. Right. But you know, maybe, maybe one of them is mad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you said earlier, you, you weren't a ghost hunter, but you were actually, uh, an audio engineer. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I come from a background in recording studios. So I, uh, I currently live outside of Nashville. That's why mm -hmm. I moved to Tennessee from New Orleans. I worked up on Music Row for years and years, uh, worked in country music uh, with a lot of with a lot of artists up there. And, um, you know, about six years ago, I, I just really fell in love with podcasting and um, wanted to start making some stuff of my own. I, I kind of got tired of of making everybody else's records and wanted my own little creative endeavor. And <laughs> Um, you know, I was really interested in this and, and was, you know, hung out a lot with storytellers, you know, that were, you know, songwriters really. And, mm -hmm. uh, and was just in such that kind of culture that this was kind of a natural progression for me when I, you know, I got a little tired of, uh, like I said, making everybody else's art, you know. <laughs> when I was reading your bio, uh, I, I, it says that you work with uh, George Strait and Miranda Lambert. And I was curious, did they ever yeah. have any ghost stories for you or anything like oh, that? Oh, no, we never talked about ghosts. No, <laughs> it was always work. No, but I mean, but George Strait is a wonderful man. And I, and I will take every opportunity to tell everyone that, you know, I was always the youngest guy in the room uh, when I worked with him. Probably about four or five records I did with him, mm -hmm. um, you know, as I was coming up. And I was always the youngest in the room. And and um, I, I have a lot of respect for him on how he treats people. And, and there's a reason he's the king of country, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, you could tell, definitely tell that guy's a class act. I, I, a 100%. <laughs> and he is exactly as he seems. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so back to uh, back to spooky stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> since, yeah. since the country singers couldn't give you anything to work with. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. So I mean, most of most of your show is like a solo show, and it's really relaying mm -hmm. like a lot of the different stories from uh, from the different areas of the South. Right. Yeah, it's a narrative show, so everything's scripted. Um, I uh, I work with my sister on the project. She's a she's a researcher by trade. Um, she works out of the Louisiana State Museum. She's an archivist. Mm -hmm. Um, so she's got the master's in library science. You know, just I mean, research is you know, her bug. So, uh, you know, we kind of built it a little together and she is of course, as an archivist, as a museum person, she never wants to be seen or heard. She, uh, wants to, uh, stay in the background and, um, you know, she kind of, uh, brings a little bit of authenticity to the research, you know, we've been able to find a lot more because of, you know, her knowledge base and, and, and what she can do. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's been very beneficial that way, but, uh, the show itself is presented as a narrative. So it's scripted. Um, it's, it's me just telling you a story, breaking down how the story works, um, putting a little spooky vibe on it too. You know, of course, since, because of my audio background, I, I put a lot of music and a lot of sound design into it yes. and really try and make it come to life. So you get a little, a little bit more going on than, than just kind of, uh, having to listen to me, you know? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, it always tends to add, especially with like the spooky podcasts, that if you got that right sound design in there and it, it just creates such an atmosphere for the listener. I mean, if, if they're not, you're not on YouTube, right? You, you're just an, an audio podcast? Just audio. I mean, we're, you know, we're on, you can find us on YouTube, but it's not, it's not video of me talking right. at all. It's, you know, it's one of those little squiggly line audiograms. Yeah. 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 And, and at least it, it kind of puts everybody in like the right mood because it, that's probably the mood that you want to convey when you're telling these stories anyway. Right. Yeah. You know, I think, I think early on when I made the show and I was thinking about the vibe, you know, I wanted it, I wanted it to feel like when you turned on my show, it sounded like you were here in a war, in a specific world, right? Like you knew you were on this podcast. And I, I think it's something that, you know, most people like when, you know, when they turn on a TV or they turn on movies or, or a television show or something, you know, just based on like the colors and the cinematography, sometimes they know, you know, either what show they're on or maybe what network, like, you know, if you're watching an HBO show versus a network television show, right? Just, right. I mean, within seconds almost. And so um, I, I really wanted to kind of have a, a similar thing 
with that when it came to audio was you know if you if you heard a few seconds it felt like you were kind of zapped over to the southern gothic world and and you lived in this kind of space while you were with me yeah right and and your shows are are, are safe we we should probably tell that to people that it's not right it's, you know it's not going to give people nightmares for weeks or anything like that i, I, I don't think so no yeah. no i don't think no you know it's it's akin to like if you if you go if you were to come to a small town or something and you were to take their haunted history tour you know, right. it's not, it's not really, um, you know, I do a little historic true crime, you know, every now and then, you know, there's something that might need like a little bit of a trigger warning on it. You know, um, it's not very violent. It's not, you know, I, I don't curse or anything. Um, I, you know, I, I would say, I, I don't think I, we really go much past PG 13. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my, my nine-year-old knows a lot of the stories. Uh, maybe that says something poor about my parenting at the same time, <laughs> but uh, she doesn't seem to really blink much. There's certainly some stories she never wants to hear, right? Um, you know, and doesn't really, she's not listening all the time, but I, I never really worry too much if she overhears some. Um, so yeah, it's it's pretty, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly uh, benign. I don't think you're really going to, you know, be afraid of what's in the closet listening to my show. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, and ultimately, you know, they are ghost stories, you know, and, and that, that's why people are going to tune into you. They, they, they love a good ghost story and you're, you're just delivering right, right to them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I call it, I said, it's ghost stories and haunted history. So if you, uh, if you're into sitting around the campfire and hearing ghost stories, hey, there's something there for you that way. If you're somebody who wants a little bit more like meat on the bones when it comes to, uh, you know, background and history. There's something for you there as well. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, what what's uh, one of your favorite stories that that you've told? Sure. In, yeah, in, well, was it your podcast? You know, one I've been talking about recently, uh, since we were talking about traveling and cemeteries, is uh, just recently I was out in Charleston, and um, while I was out there, you know, I, I went to a bunch of different places. Of course, you know, Charleston is obviously a, a pretty haunted city with a very old history, right? Um, and, and out there in Charleston, there's just, I mean, downtown Charleston, uh, you can't, you know, pass a building without it being haunted. There's so many ghost tours down there, you know, Charleston, Savannah, and New Orleans are just, you know, just epic when it comes to stories. But, uh, there's this one story that, that I have been fascinated with and enjoyed from that area for a long time. That's actually outside the city out on, on Adisto Island. Okay. And it's this. It's basically a, one of the sea islands that are off on the coast out there. It used to be a whole lot of plantations out there. And they were mm -hmm. they were har har harvesting things like indigo and rice and all this. And, you know, the rich people from Charleston own plantations out there. And that's where they made their money. Right. And uh, we decided to go on down to, down there to, to Adisto Island, uh, to this cemetery at Adisto Presbyterian Church. And the cemetery has its old cemetery, dates all the way back to the early, or excuse me, the late 1700s. Uh, beautiful. It looks like you see Charleston in movies. This beautiful old white church. You got the oak trees with moss coming down. It was, you know, you're out in the country even. So it really had that, you know, vibe to it. And, you know, the air, you could hear the, the insects buzzing while you're out there. It just... <laughs> It was everything you imagine when you think of the low country and beautiful cemetery. And in the very back of the cemetery, there's this mausoleum. It just kind of stands out. It's big rose red mausoleum. Okay. And it was, it was made of marble and the name up top, it says Legree, but there's no door to the mausoleum. And according to local lore, the reason they don't have a door to the mausoleum is years ago, the door kept opening up and every time they came and they would relock the door. It would just open back up again. And it just, they could not keep the door to this mausoleum closed, right? So eventually they just took the door off the hinges and they left it wide open for you to visit. All right. And the story behind that door has to do with the young woman who was interred in inside this tomb. So uh, it was a young woman by the name of Julia Seabrook Legree and her family, the Seabrook family, they owned a plantation out on Nisto Island. And uh, she eventually married into the Legree family. John Legree was was her husband. And, um, you know, they spent most of their time in Charleston during the summer. Uh, because it was so hot and humid out on the island, right? But, uh, you know, during the cooler months, they'd go back out to Adisto Island. They had a beautiful plantation home out there. And of course, 
you know, they had a plantation. They had a, a, a t- I mean, a massive enslaved population that was harvesting their crop. And uh, while she was out there one summer, or excuse me, one, uh, one, I believe it was one spring, while she was out there, she came, she got sick, you know, and they didn't really know why at this point in time, but she got very ill and just kept getting worse and worse. And very quickly, it went downhill. And after about a week, they thought she had died because all of a sudden, just her pulse and her breathing had just gotten so heavy that she just seemed to pass away in the middle of the night, right? So the family came and all, and and they decided, well, you know, here we are in this humid weather. We need to bury her very quickly. We need to get before her body starts to decompose. Uh, you know, we're going to take her to the family tomb, which was this beautiful red mausoleum with Legree up top. So they went and they interred her with, within 24 hours. They took Julia's body and put her in the mausoleum. Then they locked the door and they went home, right? Well, no. Long after that, people who were visiting the cemetery and were were going to going to mass out at the church, right? They said that every now and then they would hear this crying from this woman echoing through the cemetery. And they didn't know where it was coming from, but then hear this at night. Sometimes people would hear it during the day. It was kind of freaking them out for a while, but it eventually went away and people stopped talking about it and everybody went on with their life, right? But about five years later, Julia's brother, actually, he he was in the Civil War and he was killed in action out in the Civil War and they sent his body home and they decided to have a funeral there and they were going to inter him in this mausoleum out there on Adisto Island. And so they go and they unlock the family mausoleum. And as soon as they open the door, to their surprise, Julia's bones came crashing down on them. They had buried Julia alive. And she spent weeks in there clawing at that door, trying to get out. Of course, the family was absolutely horrified, right? Uh, uh, Completely aghast that this happened. Not only are they, at this point in time, they're afraid because, or they're upset because they're burying their son. And now they also find out that they had basically killed their daughter because she wasn't, you know, she, she wasn't dead when they buried her. So- they, of course, reinterred her in the tomb alongside with her brother and, um, you know, locked that door away. But av- ever since, after that occasion, the door refused to stay closed. And over and over again, that door would keep opening up. And folks always said that was Julia. She refused to be locked back in that tomb ever since. So if you go on down to Adisto Island and you go and you visit this mausoleum, you can go inside. There's no door there whatsoever. You can go inside and pay your respects and, you know, and actually see some of the markings on the wall from where they said she was actually scratching and trying to get out of the mausoleum. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why I need to give you chills. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a one, I mean, a fascinating story, you know. Now, I will say, when it comes to the historical accuracy of the story, a lot of that, some of that just we really can't actually, you know, verify right. if she really was buried alive or not. But, you know, I, I said that I'm not a ghost hunter, but, you know, of course, we like to dabble in some of this stuff. So when we went down to the mausoleum, we actually took dowsing rods inside. You know, you ever heard of dowsing rods before? No. All right, so this is a very old school kind of ghost hunting, old school kind of, it's a way folks would even find water and all. These are copper rods, right? And these copper rods, they say, you know, they've got uh, the ones that that we have, they have these little tubes. So essentially you'll hold these two L-shaped rods and they stick out. And now, you know, folks would use it to to find like energy or something, right? Or find water. You know, I, I have a friend of mine, he's a plumber. And he's from Ireland. And this is still how he finds water lines. He still believes up and down. This is, you know, he walks around with these copper, copper dowsing rods and they cross. So the rods will just kind of, you know, you, you hold them either loose enough in your hands or you have ones, like I said, that, you know, have little kind of handles to them and they'll cross or they'll kind of go wide. Right. And, and the way it goes is when you, you can communicate with spirits with these dowsing rods, because the spirits will move the rods for you. Right. And so like, you can ask you questions, you know, you could say, you know, oh, or is, is there someone here? 
And, you know, and, and the spirit will move the rods. And if the rods happen to cross in front of you, well, that would be a yes. If they go wide, that would be a no, right? Or maybe you might be able, well, where are you? And maybe both the rods kind of move and point towards an area. So uh, we took some dowsing rods out to, to Julia's tomb and we, we tried to talk to her and asked her if she was there. And of course, you know, Julia, are you here? And then the dowsing rods crossed and it said, yes, right? And so it's like, okay, well, well, Julia, you know, I, I've been telling your story to a lot of people lately. Is that okay? You know, and then then the rods crossed again. It said okay. So, you know, I was like, oh, thank gosh. You know, <laughs> you know like, Ooh. you know, here I am standing at your tomb. You know, I, I do not need the the bad vibes of this one. You know, and then we asked, we said, Well, well, Julia, is this story true that you were buried alive? And those two things went wide and said no. You know, so, so whether or not how scientifically accurate, you know, those dousing rods are, you know, (laughs) Julia told me personally that that's not actually a true story, but, you know, but obviously she's still there kind of hanging out and the, the legend has lasted all those years. And, and it, it, it obviously, you know, it, it draws attention to her and it keeps her name, you know, in, in history, because people will come to that cemetery and visit her tomb. Oh, wow. (laughs) I think if like a door would have appeared at some point, I'd be like, okay, we're done here. I think yeah, it's time for us here. to leave. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I will say it was, it was probably about two o'clock in the afternoon when I visited. It was not at night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not that crazy, right? <laughs> no, did, did not go to the, uh, no, I, I don't, I mean, yeah, I can't remember the last time I went to a cemetery at night, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. That's probably the safest time if you're going to do anything there. At least you have witnesses, too. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, my 15 year old came with me and, uh, you know, that 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 one's just as crazy as the ghosts are. So, yeah. <laughs> when you're not doing your podcast, what what mm-hmm. podcasts do you like to listen to, Brandon? Sure. Well, you know, I actually I do. I, I edit and help produce a couple other ones. So, you know, I, I work with a show called uh, One Strange Thing which is another kind of paranormal kind of weird stuff podcast. Um, and uh, I also work with a, a show called Southern Fried True Crime, which is a true crime show uh, with Southern. It's a big show. It's very popular. And uh, Erica is a wonderful woman, does a fantastic job as that. But, um, you know, on my own, what I enjoy mostly, you know, I listen to uh, when it comes to ghosts and things of that nature. I am an absolute fanboy for um, Astonishing Legends. Uh, those guys are wonderful people. You know, I've had a chance to become friends with them as well. And they just do these deep dives into some of the weirdest stuff. They did They did a six-part series. And when I say six parts, each part was like two hours long just on exploring the Patterson-Gimlin film, which is the, the film of Bigfoot from the 70s. Okay. All right. So if you can imagine a nine hour breakdown of this Bigfoot legend, um, you know, for the real nerds out there. (laughs) So, um, you know, so I really enjoy the show, Astonishing Legends. Um, I absolutely idolize uh, Mike Brown, who does a show called Pleasing Terrors. It's a show. um, He is a tour guide from Charleston. Mike is. And uh, he does does a show called Pleasing Terrors. But what he does is he doesn't put one out all the time. He, uh, he, He had put out a handful back in the day and now just he just takes his time researching and writing something and just if you're lucky every six months something new will drop in the feed and it is a beautifully written show and he just does this incredible job research and 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 i just look at him as as a guy that that i look up to and really kind of you know um you know look at as is really setting a, a good example as to what i would want to do so um, those are two shows I listen to and, uh, you know, and also listen to like a smattering of just other random things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some of the other popular ones, you know, so a couple business ones here or there and personal growth ones, of course, cause I podcasts are what they are now. Right. I mean, it's, it's everything. So, yeah, <laughs> very true. And and we have a portion of the show and it's called shameless self-promotion. Yeah. And this is where you can let everybody know where they can follow Southern Gothic. Shameless self-promotion. Yeah. Well, you know, Southern Gothic is available on all your favorite podcast apps. You can get it on Apple podcasts, Spotify, 
Amazon Music, they're doing a lot of promotion right now. Uh, well, you can't get it on Stitcher anymore, can you? Stitcher's gone. But, uh, you know, and you can also get as we are on YouTube. We don't keep totally up to date with YouTube. And like I said, it is a little squiggly line. And you can, of course, visit our website at southerngothicmedia.com. There you go. Brandon, thank you so much for swinging by the show. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Jim. I really appreciate it. Now it's time for Sherpa samples. If you've got a podcast you'd like us to sample, contact us and we'll mention your name on the show. Ah, yes. Sherpa samples. One of my favorite parts of the show. For those of you who are new to this segment, it's when I get to check out some podcasts that are on the podcast charts and we'll fill you in on them. You know, it's not really about reviewing the podcast, but just to kind of let you know what these shows are all about. You know, there are a whole bunch of them. There are 200 podcasts on the podcast app that I listen to that are on the charts, and I'm going to listen to every single one of them, even if it kills me. And it shouldn't kill me. I don't think too many people have died listening to podcasts. Well, I want to hope that anyway. So what do we have this week? Uh, there are 10 that I've checked out, and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here this week. The first one is Time Suck, and that is hosted by Dan Cummins, who is a stand-up comic who's very funny. And he does a lot of deep dives into historical events and people and all sorts of different stories. Uh, he's a really talented comic. I've probably listened to the first 150 episodes or so, not yesterday, but in the past, and uh, actually started listening again for the sample of this, and I heard an episode about the Library of Alexandria, which I'm so old, I think I actually have a library card there. Thank you. I'll be here all week. Enjoy the veal. Get Played is hosted by Heather, Nick, and Matt. I think it was originally called How Did This Get Played? But maybe they didn't want to confuse it with the other podcast that we've spoken about, How Did This Get Made? And Get Played is actually about video games. And the episode that I heard... They spoke to comic Taryn Killam in about, I believe it was Mortal Kombat and all sorts of other topics and very funny stuff. And if you're into video games, it's definitely a podcast that you'd like to check out. Generation Y is a very popular true crime podcast. It's hosted by two friends, Aaron and Justin. And the episode that they did was about the Oliver Scissors. I hadn't heard about this. These were uh, three young girls who uh, were found murdered and in a pond. And and they talk about the circumstances around this case. Gruesome stuff. Ooh, gruesome. Blowback is uh, a podcast about places, I guess, where America has been involved. And the season that they're just starting now uh, has to do with the American presence in Afghanistan. And obviously that starts from uh, September 11th, 2001, but of course, uh, the US and Afghanistan have had a lengthy history, and it kind of goes into all of the stories involving our presence there and what goes on in that country. After Bedtime with Big Little Feelings is hosted by Kirsten and Dina, and Big Little Feelings apparently is an online community, which is very large, that has to do with parenting, and that's what the podcast is about, of course, After Bedtime. Get it? Uh, it the language gets a little sweary sometimes, so it's not a parenting podcast that you want to listen to in front of the kids. I would suggest that. But uh, definitely uh, interesting, and they definitely relay their experiences as parents as well in the podcast. Let's be honest with Kristen Cavallari. Now, here we go again. Uh, Kristen Cavallari, I think she was on Laguna Beach, which was a reality series on MTV. And who does he have on the show? Yes, we're revisiting it. It's been a while. I shouldn't complain, right? Stassi Schroeder from, yes, that's correct, Vanderpump Rules. Oh, this is a TV show that will not go away. <laughs> and I believe Stassi Schroeder also hosts her own podcast about Vanderpump Rules as well. There was just no escaping this show. I do not know why, Rebels. I do not know why. There were a few that I really enjoyed, though, at, out of this bunch. Uh, you know, the ones that I listened to were very good, but these were particularly interesting. Uh, exposed cover-up at Columbia University. This has to do with a story about a Dr. Robert Haddon, who actually was a uh, OBGYN who sexually abused his patients. 
and how they finally brought him to justice and that there was a big cover up in Columbia University, as the title said so. Uh, it's kind of graphic and it's kind of shocking the stuff that you will hear, but it is a story that is uh, well told. It's not over sensationalized, just a real presentation of the, you know, these horrible facts about this person. Uh, I was commenting to my wife the other day that I'm actually starting to see these uh, lawyer commercials about bringing suit against Dr. Haddon. So I guess it's really uh, come full circle and hopefully he's getting uh He's getting his due per you know per his victims. The Frank Skinner Show is a Saturday morning radio show, which uh, airs over in England. I don't know if it's on the BBC or not. It might be on a, on another radio network. And Frank Skinner actually isn't his actual name. I forgot what his real name is, but it's him and uh, two other people. Uh, very British, you know what that means, like. When I say very British, that means I don't get all the jokes. But I really enjoyed this. Uh, it's definitely a lot of fun. Uh, they they definitely are very clever and, and, and enjoyable. And it was definitely a pleasant surprise listening to that show, I, I must say. And also, uh, We're Here to Help, uh, which is hosted by Jake and Gareth. Uh, Gareth, I think, was on the podcast called The Dollop, if I'm not mistaken. And it's basically like an advice show and uh, people call them with unusual <laughs> requests for advice. Uh, one woman was calling about uh, using an appropriate accent for playing Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> but uh, it, it was a cute show, you know, not really too uh, crazy, but uh, definitely enjoyable. Well done, gentlemen. Well done. And finally, this was one that really surprised me. It's called Sunday Sports Club. And and I hope I'm saying this woman's name right. It's Allison Kush, or Kush, I'm sorry. Uh, she's married to uh, an NFL player. And she talks about football, and she breaks it down for people who aren't really initiated with the game of football. And uh, I know she's going to go deeper into detail about some of the behind-the-scenes drama. Her explanation of everything that goes on with having a husband playing for an NFL team is really fascinating. I really enjoyed the way that she did it. It was definitely very entertaining. So if you don't get football and you're wondering what it's all about, and maybe you want to hear a little, what do they call it? Spill tea. I, I try not to spill my tea. <laughs> this might be a podcast that you want to check out. So since I have probably spilled my tea somewhere, I'm going to have to get some paper towels. If so we will just head on into the outro. Be a rebel. Follow the show at Share Pollution on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. A very special thanks to Brandon of Southern Gothic for swinging on by. Make sure you check out his podcast. It's some good stuff. And you know, with Halloween coming up, it'll be nice and spooky. <laughs> and uh, something that's not so spooky is following my show on social media. I don't know why that's not spooky. Well, because I'm there, I guess. I don't know. You can follow me at Sherpolution on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and even TikTok sometimes, too. I don't make funny little videos on there. I'm there. And you can also listen to the show on our Sherpolution YouTube channel. Uh, no video. You're welcome. Trust me. And, of course, our website where there's so much going on, Sherpolution.com. So thank you very much for listening. And until then, I will see you next time with another wonderful show right here. Too many podcasts. Be here or be square or something like that. I don't know. I was always square. So I, I always never know how to oh, be there. That's what it is. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Lord Mr. Moose. Oh, you're giving me the sign that we have to leave. Okay, fine. We will leave. Until then, Rebels of the Sherpolution, I say to you, Viva La Sherpolution. Thanks for listening to Too Many Podcasts. Please disperse. You can go home now. I said you can go home now. Viva la chapelition. Viva la chapelition. <coughs> oh. Yell, come back now, you hear?
You know, Rebels, if you've been checking out some of my promotional ads on social media, you will be aware that I have been using a lot of AI programs to help me create ads. But you know what? There's a lot more uses for AI than just funny little videos. And I'd like to introduce one of our new sponsors, Podium. It is a leader in creating AI tools for podcasters. Now, let's say you've got a podcast and maybe you're even thinking of doing a podcast. You're probably wondering, well, how can AI be integrated with your workflow? I'll tell you about Podium. As a podcaster, you know that writing show notes and creating chapters and transcribing episodes takes a lot of time and it can cost you a lot of money too. But you know what? That's where Podium comes in. It's an AI tool designed specifically for creators and podcasters with the goal of making post-production tasks quick and easy. And in just a few minutes, Podium generates show notes, chapters, summaries, clips for social media, a full transcript, suggested episode titles, social media posts, and more. Whew, that's a lot of work for one little program. You're your show notes are key to your podcast's success because it helps new listeners find your podcast and they'll know if it's a fit for them. You know, it's kind of like too many podcasts. It also improves your SEO. That's your search engine optimization. Ooh, big phrase there. And overall accessibility. And with Podium, you can focus on creating a great podcast and let Podium's AI do the heavy lifting. But Podium isn't just for solo creators and podcasters. It's a game changer for editors, producers, marketers, agencies, and production studios. Teams that use Podiums are able to increase workloads, decrease turnaround times, and improve their quality. How does it work? Very easy. First, go to Podium's website, and you'll see that link that's right there in the show notes. You get three hours free just to try it. Pretty cool, huh? And using that link also supports this show as well. And you know what else happens? Because I'm a good guy. You use my link, you will get 50% off for your first month. So visit the site, upload an MP3 file, and download your files, and that's it. And if you need anything else, you can use Podium GPT to generate articles and any marketing copy you might need in seconds, instant show notes, transcripts, chapters for your podcast or channel. This will level up that podcast. So check out Podium today.